so I was told, you know, you need to go get tested. You're obviously very allergic to something. And so I went and got tested. Um, and even though milk never, I was not a big milk drinker. It never really felt good to me. I still was eating some cheese here and there and these different things um, and didn't really think about it too much. And I tested highly allergic to casein. Welcome to Plant-Based CFW with Dr. Riz and Maya. Marla Ablin is a registered and licensed dietitian and nutritionist who graduated with honors from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center of Dallas. Marla's mission is to meet clients where they are and guide them towards their goals via knowledge, counseling, and practical application of evidence-based nutrition science. Let's listen in as Marla shares her personal story and talks about how she works with clients one-on-one. -on -one. So hi, Marla. Hey, Maya. How are you today? I'm good. It's good to be here. Well, thank you for coming. So I want to mention before we dive into all of this that we know each other really from the plant-based world. Um, I've seen you speak when you give your lunch and learn sort of uh, events with Nature's Plate. Right, right. And, uh, and I can tell you're highly educated and well um, studied in this field in terms of your registered dietitian work and plant-based nutrition. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, being a dietitian is a second career for me. I started out as an engineer. I got my degree at UT Austin, and I worked uh, in construction management for about 10 years. And then after having kids, I decided to change careers and pursue what had previously really just been a strong interest or a hobby. Um, and so right after graduation, um, I became, after I graduated with my clinical dietetics degree, I became an affiliate with Girls to Women Health and Wellness and worked primarily with adolescents. Um, and then about six years ago, I opened up my own office. Um, when I became, uh, when I focused my business more on plant-based eating, I decided that I, it was time for me to go out on my own. And um, I've been uh, in private practice ever since. Wow. So you initially started as an engineer. Yes. <laughs> Look at that. And then the interest in nutrition that you sort of started, but without it being a business yet. Right. What brought you to that interest in the first place? So that is a good question. And that, I don't, I don't have a very short answer for that question. Uh, but I, I, I will tell you that I grew up in a dieting household. And so my first introduction to good nutrition had to do with uh, Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers and different dieting program, you know, programs, whatever my mom was trying that year. Um, so food always seemed to be the enemy. Mm -hmm. Eating was always a struggle. Um, and I knew by the time I was a teenager that I, I was going to prefer to have a different relationship, a better relationship with food. I wanted to be able to enjoy food and I wanted to be able to be healthy. Um, then I went off to college, and being a poor college student, as a lot of us were, um, and I didn't know how to cook, and I couldn't afford meat, and I couldn't afford to eat out much, and so I just didn't eat meat. Um, I don't think I, I ate very healthfully at the time, but at any rate, I would go home and be served meat, and I would realize it really made me feel poorly. I would have terrible stomach aches and, and be constipated, and I just didn't like it. So. Um, slowly over time, during those college years, I became a uh, vegetarian. Um, and then later, when uh, I was married, my father-in-law actually had colon cancer, and he tried uh, curing his colon cancer with a macrobiotic diet. Mm -hmm. And he, he was successful in um, shrinking his tumors or keeping them from growing, but he did end up having surgery. But in the meantime, over the course of the years, while he struggled with that, we wanted to support him in his efforts. So we learned all about the macrobiotic diet and we did a lot more cooking according uh, to that diet plan. Um, so th and that's really when I learned how to cook. So I was cooking a lot of rice mm -hmm. and beans. Um, and then later, again, this is a little bit of a long journey for me, but later I, had, um, I became pregnant with twins and uh, they came early, they were in the NICU. And so I was pumping milk for them. They were too, uh, they weren't strong enough to breastfeed directly. So I had to, had to pump and bring the milk to the hospital. And one day I got there a few minutes late and uh, I was very upset to learn that they had given them formula. Mm -hmm. And it was a cow's milk formula. Mm -hmm. And they both got sick. They both retched it up. And you know, they were still only at that point, maybe four, four and a half pounds. And, um, and it prolonged their NICU stay by several days. And it was just horrifying for me. And I really, 
I couldn't understand why in the world the hospital would even dream of giving my tiny little infants formula that could possibly make them ill. Um, and it, it was very upsetting to me. Um, so anyhow, after that I became, I actually decided to become a La Leche League leader and I taught breastfeeding oh. to women because I thought, well, I don't want anybody to have, you know, the same experience that I have and people need to know about breastfeeding and how to do it and how to properly f um, feed their infants. Um, and so then I had my third son and, um, and I can tell you a little bit more about that later, but um, we, we traveled one summer with the three boys and um, this is what finally clinched it for me and, and it's why I decided to go back to school and get a second degree. Um, we were on a little airplane. It was back when the, 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 the kids could, you know, if they were under two, they could fly for free. So, so we had the kids all over us, right? And it was uncomfortable. We were on a tiny little plane and they had put all the families at the back of the plane and kids were crying and fussing. And uh, a mother in the back was uh, passing around a container of uh, Nutter Butter cookies. So my children, being my children, had never had a store-bought cookie. You know, wow. all the cookies I made were with whole grains and, and fruit sweetened and, you know. And I, you know, at first I said, no, thank you. And my husband says, let them have the Nutter Butter. You know, oh, okay, okay, okay. So they, they, they all bit into their Nutter Butters and they said, oh, mommy, what is this? You know, they, and I was like, no. Oh, they've no, tasted the, the sugar. You know, the sugar and, you know, now what are we going to do? <laughs> so, you know, they enjoyed their cookie and they, they sat and they were fine. And then I hear some more fussing behind us and the kids in the back, they wanted more cookies. And the mother says to them, fine, fine, fine. You can have another cookie, but not until you finish your Coke. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And I sat there and my husband saw me and, you know, he's like, stay calm, stay calm. Don't say anything. And I said, no, no, I'm not saying anything to them, but I'm going to be a dietitian. Mm -hmm. I, I have to, I have to write this wrong in the world, you know. And, Amazing. Yeah. So even before you went on and got your degree, right, right, uh, you had spent all these years pretty much educating yourself and learning how to eat clean, right. So right. then what happens once you entered the field or once uh, you did your formal training and they teach you contrary to what you know? Is that what you experienced? Um, a little bit, yes, and. I just had to tell myself that the credential was important yes, and that I have a lot to learn. And as an adult, because I went back to school in my 40s, um, I could have knowledge and opinion and I could uh, debate things with the professors or I could just listen to what they had to say and go with it and do my own research. So I did a little bit of both. I wanted to know what they had to say. Um, and they certainly talked about vegetarian and vegan diets mm -hmm. and um, you know the academy even says the academy of nutrition and dietetics says that uh, well-planned vegan and vegetarian diets can be healthy or healthier than the standard american diet but they preface it always by saying well-planned and as a dietitian what i decided and many of us say is that well yes you have to spend some time planning these types of diets but really any diet should be well-planned in order for it to be well-rounded and nutritional. That's true. Yeah. So um, I listened to what they had to say, and certainly they taught me so much about clinical situations, about disease states, about treatments, about prevention. Mm -hmm. and, and UT Southwestern had a fantastic coordinated program so that when we studied diabetes, then we went on rotation for a few weeks and worked with diabetes patients. When we studied heart disease, then we went into clinic and worked with people with heart disease. So we got that hands-on experience right away. Mm -hmm. um, and then we got to choose some of our own clinics to do. And so I did a lot of work with pediatrics um, and with uh, autoimmune diseases um, and, uh, and, and different things that I was interested yeah, in. Yeah. So, I like that, and that's partly why we enjoy working with you when Dr. Riz gives lectures, so we have a movie screening or something like that. We like having you around because you know, you know exactly what to say and how to answer the questions. Mm -hmm. um, now, did you at that time work closely with physicians or other, other experts? Yes, yeah, so when I graduated, I, I went to uh, be an affiliate with Girls to Women Health and Wellness, and so they were an outfit that worked primarily with adolescent girls. Um, uh, and so I saw mostly adolescent girls, but I would see their younger siblings or their older siblings and sometimes see their parents as well. And so they would come in with a certain diagnostic um, and then I would uh, work with them to change their diet to help them be healthier. So, you know, I was looking at the labs a lot and, and consulting with the physicians. 
Um, All right. Yes, that's awesome. And I wanted to sort of clarify when we, and you and I understand what we mean by whole plant-based food. So um, I like to actually steal a line from La Leche League. Every, every fourth meeting we would do a nutrition class. And what we would tell people was to eat a wide variety of foods in as close to their natural state as possible. So I, I further explain that by telling my clients that a food should be something that you can recognize. It, it should not be a list of ingredients. Okay. So the, the fake meats, and mm -hmm. I think you've heard me say this before, mm -hmm. have their place in the world. Mm -hmm. um, they're great for people who are transitioning to a plant-based diet or to a vegan diet. Um, and they are great for, um, you know, they, they, they help save animals and they help uh, with, with the climate and everything. Mm -hmm. um, they have their place, but I wouldn't really call them whole food plant-based. There's still a processed vegan food. Right, right. And in that processing, they typically have added oils, added sugar, added Correct. salt, all that other stuff Correct. that still can harm us, right? Right, that can harm us and then yeah. the nutrients are often depleted. Um, so they're not as nutritionally dense. They don't have as many nutrients per calorie mm -hmm. um, as other whole foods would have. Right, and mm -hmm. I, I like the approach that I heard someone say before that in the grocery store, you start in the produce section. Absolutely. That's where you typically want to be. Right. And then if you have to go, I guess, um, how do you feel about say canned beans and canned vegetables? Sure, so there's a wide spectrum, spectrum of processed foods, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's the fresh produce, which is completely unprocessed. And then there are things like frozen dinners where after the third ingredient, you don't even recognize what's in there anymore. Um, and then there's everything in between. So frozen fruit, yes, there's been some processing done or frozen vegetables, but, but they're still a good choice. They're still a whole food that you can recognize. Um, canned beans, I think, are a great solution for busy people who maybe haven't learned how to batch cook yet or they're not interested maybe in, in soaking beans overnight and cooking them from scratch. Um, you know, I would suggest people try to get organic when they can with the beans mm -hmm. and then certainly rinse them to, to uh, get rid of some of the, the sodium. And, and we want to, you know, the reason I say to get organic is because we want to avoid some of the preservatives that could be in uh, canned goods otherwise. That's true. Um, and, and then I've heard that in the frozen vegetables, for example, that's, they're frozen at their best state, aren't they? They are right yes. at the, they're at the perfect stage. Uh, ideally, yes. Ideally. And hopefully most companies okay. do that. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's not... I, I still always say fresh is best, but the second choice would definitely be frozen. Okay. And you know, when, when certain foods are out of season and you want to eat them, as we all do, um, you know, frozen blueberries in the wintertime when you just can't get blueberries or they're not very fresh or they're way too expensive, absolutely keep a bag of frozen blueberries in the freezer. Okay. And what about the person that does want to eat whole foods but is afraid of carbs? What would you say? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> One of our favorite topics. Right. So um, I have been told, you know, asked, well, I thought, you know, fruit is bad for us, isn't it? Because it's so much sugar. Okay, so let's let's learn about carbohydrates. So all fruit has carbohydrates. Vegetables have carbohydrates. Grains have carbohydrates. Beans have carbohydrates. Um, the only thing that really doesn't have carbohydrate is meat and, and eggs. So, um, and in the blue zones, they eat mm -hmm. primarily carbohydrate, high carbohydrate diets. What they don't eat are process carbohydrates. They don't eat the processed sugar. They don't eat the white breads and the white rices and the white pastas. They don't eat the foods that, again, have lists and lists of ingredients um, of things that you can't understand. So mm -hmm. a good example would be um, a box of cereal. Mm -hmm. So a box of cereal could be okay, could have three or four ingredients that could be whole grain. And yes, it, it is minimally processed, but you know, if you want to keep it in the house as a very convenient uh, thing to have, you know, um, instead of your oats every now and then, it might be okay. But then if you look at some cereal that has all processed grains in it, it has a high level of sugar um, compared to the amount of fiber in it, and again has ingredients that you don't recognize, sugars in all different types of forms, that's a very highly processed carbohydrate. Leave mm -hmm. it on the shelf, mm -hmm. don't buy it. Okay. And from what I've heard, carbohydrates are our main source of energy, right? Our Correct. body, that's what our body wants. That, that is sense. what our body wants, and that's what our brain is fueled by. Before you became um, plant-based, mm -hmm. did you experience any health problems, and did they resolve? Sure, so absolutely. So yes, I actually went through a couple of situations. Um, after I had the kids, I started breaking out in hives on occasion, <laughs> and it was very odd. And twice, uh, my face swelled so badly that my throat was closing, and we had to, uh, I had to guzzle Benadryl, and you know, on the way to the emergency room, and um, and then was shot up with epinephrine, and 
and given steroids in it. And it's a very, very uncomfortable, horrible uh, situation to be in, very scary. And so I was told, you know, you need to go get tested. You're obviously very allergic to something. And so I went and got tested. Um, and even though milk never, I was not a big milk drinker. It never really felt good to me. I still was eating some cheese here and there and these different things um, and didn't really think about it too much. And I tested highly allergic to casein, which is a milk protein. Yes. Yeah. So I was told you absolutely cannot have any more ever. And here's an EpiPen that you will carry the rest of your life. So, <laughs> you know, I was already vegetarian. And so then I just decided, okay, now I'm vegan. That's it. No more, you know. And, um, and I stopped giving dairy to my children. That high level of uh, aller allergic reaction that you were having to the casing, is that common? I see a lot more. What's common is lactose intolerance. Okay. And so I people see. would avoid dairy for that reason. And sure. I could go into a whole slew of information on that. But um, the casein allergy is a little bit more... Rare, but you know what? I would really love to see a study on that to show what percentage of the population is allergic to casein okay. at this point. Well, look at so. that. You know, I've never heard of that. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that people could be allergic to yeah. the casein. Yeah. Casein. And it's a different, re again, it's, it's that, it's that uh, inflammatory reaction that your, auto that your immune system is causing. It's, yeah. And how soon after uh, you stopped consuming dairy did you notice no longer oh, having hives or anything? Thank you for asking. Yes. <laughs> Not only did I not have hives, but I had always been told that I had seasonal allergies. And let me tell you, my seasonal allergies were all year round. Mm -hmm. I came off of all my allergy <laughs> medicine. Seasonal. Yeah. And, and I came off all the allergy medicine. I, I used to have two to three sinus infections every single year. And I would take all kinds of antibiotics for that. I, I didn't have a single sinus infection for three or four years after I got off milk. And wow. now I... I mean, I just, it's not, you know, every five or six years I have something and, you know, instead of two or three times a year. So it's made a huge, huge and drastic improvement in my, in my health and my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, so that being said, um, when I was at UT Southwestern and I was in my senior year, I started um, losing weight. Mm -hmm. And to the point that my professors actually had a little sit down with me and said, we're worried about you, you're too thin. And I said, yeah, I just, uh, I, I just am, am stressed out senior year, uh, full-time rotations, doing my senior project. My kids are, are adolescents now, it's a little trickier, um, but I'm, I'm gonna power through this and I'm fine. And I did, I powered through it. By graduation, I knew I was terribly anemic. I knew my weight was a, an issue, um, but I was starting my new position at Girls to Women. <laughs> And, you know, and, and nobody like, you know, dietitians, doctors, healthcare um, practitioners, we don't self-diagnose very well. So, um, so it was the doctors at Girls to Women who sat me down again, Marla, you don't look so good. <laughs> What's going on with you? I said, I don't know. I don't know. And I said, you know, I feel hypercatabolic, which is not a term that most people would use. <laughs> exactly. But I said, I'm eating and eating more than I ever have. I even eat, I'm eating a whole avocado. I used to be afraid to eat avocado and I'm eating whole avocados just to try to keep the weight on. Mm -hmm. They say, okay, here's, here's the name of a physician we want you to go see. So long story, not as long. I, I went and got tested out and it took a few months and, and it turned out I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Wow. And yeah, so that, yeah. Was, that was a bit upsetting, but I thought, okay, at least I know what's going on. And um, they uh, put me on some medication to put me in remission and it took a while, um, but I, I went into remission. And at the time I was vegan, but I was not necessarily whole food plant-based. I, I was eating, you know, different, you know, the, the chicken mm -hmm. nuggets, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and after uh, a few years of uh, doing pretty well, doing pretty well, staying in remission, um, I just felt like I wasn't doing well enough. And I would go to the doctor and they'd say, well, we can give you a stronger medication. Mm -hmm. And I would look at the side effects and say, no, 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 I'm not doing that. And I had been curious about raw diets, and um, I decided, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and do that. And I tried a raw, raw diet, and after just a couple of two, three weeks, all my symptoms were gone. Wow. Yeah. All of the, the joint pain, everything was gone. And so at that point, I thought, okay, there's more to this than just being vegan. This introduced me to a whole new way of eating plants um, without the processed foods. And so now I, I do eat a large percentage of my diet as raw, um, but I've backed off a little bit so that I can eat out at restaurants and, and eat foods with other people. Um, and I know kind of what my limits are. 
um, before my Crohn's symptoms will start coming back again. Wow, like you really listen to your body. Absolutely. For people who do not know what Crohn's disease is, can you explain a little bit oh. more, maybe what the symptoms are? Yes, absolutely. So it's, it's a bit of a modern day disease. Um, there are different theories as to why people are having it, um, from uh, antibiotic overuse to diet um, to genetics. Genetics plays a role, but it's not the entire story. So it, it is an autoimmune disease and it affects the digestive tract, and that's from the mouth all the way to the bottom. And you can have flare-ups and it can destroy that part of the digestive tract. So I'm very lucky. Um, I have not had to have any of my digestive tract removed. Um, and there are studies now that show that a plant-based diet is indeed the very best diet for uh, autoimmune diseases such as Crohn's disease and that people um, improve, have many fewer flares um, and can cut back on their medications when they're on a diet like this. And, and, sh and you know, my, um, my general practitioner, my GI doctor and my rheumatologist all tell me that I am on the very best diet that there is to be with Crohn's disease. But mm -hmm. they, they, they think that people won't do it. Oh, they think wow. that people won't make the changes. But what would you say, what is the percentage of raw foods that we eat anyway on a whole food plant-based diet? Right, so I mean, is it, you know, that's such a good point. I mean, I, I think that easily people on a plant-based diet are gonna be eating at least half of their calories in raw foods because they're eating so many salads and vegetables and, and fruits um, that are all raw. Um, nuts and seeds, what we, I always promote um, to have raw nuts and seeds rather than the roasted because we don't want something that's oil roasted um, and heavily salted. Um, so it's quite easy, but the things like rice and beans and some people you know, would eat tons of broccoli and cauliflower but not raw, they prefer them lightly steamed. Okay. And so the, the, those are the areas where I say, yeah, 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 absolutely. You, you, know, you can sprout rice and eat it raw. Mm. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, sweet potato. You can spiralize sweet potato and just eat it raw. Oh, and some people tend so to think many. of it as just eating fresh foods because they hear that raw diet and they say, oh, that's you know off the deep end yeah, a little bit. Exactly. But it's really just eating fresh foods exactly. and not overcooking the foods that we're eating. What is it in the raw foods that you think might have helped to reduce the inflammation or the problem? Is it the antioxidants or? Um, I think it's just everything that we're getting more of the nutrients that we need mm -hmm. and that we're not getting the pro-inflammatory uh, processed foods, mm -hmm. um, if they're raw, and um, we're not getting oils that can be pro-inflammatory. Oh, that's right. Um, we're getting a better balance of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids that helps reduce inflammation as and well. Can you emphasize that as well? Because sure. that's the, one of the topics that always comes up. What about omega-3? Don't right. we need to eat fish or consume this and that or oil to have our omega-3s? But I've heard you say it's the ratio. It's the ratio, them. that's right. Can you right. talk more about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, 100, 150 years ago, I don't know, or longer ago, really, we were eating a lot of greens every day. Mm -hmm. um, we were not eating any processed foods because the, the kind of industrial revolution had not caught up with food yet. Um, and we were eating more whole foods. And at that point, our uh, ratio of omega-6s to 3s might have been closer to 1 to 1 or somewhere in the 4 to 1 to 1 to 1 area. Mm -hmm. um, and now we see people... Even some vegans, junk food vegans, having a ratio of 20 to 1 or 40 to 1. Wow. And the, the problem with that is, you know, it's a little tricky because omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids are essential fatty acids. That means we have to get them from the diet. Our body needs them. We have to get them from the food. We just want them in a good ratio. So the sixes are found in things like meat and milk. And then they're found in processed foods because they're in things like sunflower oil and safflower oil. And when you pick up a box of crackers or a bag of chips, those oils are always in those products. When you pick up a box of uh, cookies, uh, store-bought cookies, they're going to be in there. Okay. Um, so all these oils that are high in omega-6 fatty acids are being put in everything that we're eating, and the ratio just goes out of whack. Mm -hmm. um, now, that being said, if you want to eat sunflower seeds, uh, they are very good for you on a whole a whole foods plant-based diet and they have a good amount of omega-6 fatty acids okay. without having too many. Okay. So, and then yeah. the other side is to raise your omega-3 fatty acids, which of course we can do by eating a ton of greens, mm -hmm. flaxseed, hemp seed, and chia seeds. Those are which all are good sources. Easy, I mean, you can very make a easy. salad just like that. That's right. <laughs> so I'm interested in how you work with uh, clients. How do you guide them towards eating healthier foods? Right, so clients come to me, typically they've had an appointment with their doctor and the doctor tells them that they should either lose weight or they should eat a more anti-inflammatory diet or they should eat a heart healthy diet. And they kind of give them these vague instructions, but then the, client, the, the patient doesn't know what to do with that. 
And so hopefully the doctor then says, well, go see a dietitian, or the, the client starts looking online and they, they find me. So um, they're generally coming to me with a weight loss situation that probably has um, to do with um, their lab work being off. So they've had high cholesterol, cholesterol or high triglycerides um, or their blood sugars have been a little high um, or um, their inflammatory markers are high and they haven't been thoroughly tested to see what that's all about yet, but they're trying to work on that. So um, I, I like to, I, you know, I do an hour and a half session with my clients to start and I really get to know their likes and their dislikes, their, their, um, the amount of time that they spend on food preparation or food planning, um, what their relationship with food is all about. Um, and then, you know, they know I'm a plant-based dietitian, but a lot, you know, some will come to me directly and say, I'm not going to stop eating meat. <laughs> and I say, okay, you know, let's, let's, we, we won't go there. Let, let's, let's see what other improvements we can make. Sure. And I talk to them a lot about inflammation and what causes it in the body. I talk a lot about the importance of fiber intake and how to get fiber and how most of us are walking around eating half the fiber that we need and twice the protein that we need. And I educate them a little bit more about protein also because mostly everybody comes and says, don't I need to have protein at every meal? How do I get my protein? You know, And of course they think that only protein is in meat, whereas in fact it's in whole grains and vegetables as well. So, um, and nuts and seeds and, and beans of course. So. Um, so this is how I approach it. I, I, I don't want to tell them, well, you have to do this or you're not going to, you know, it's not going to work for you. We start with where they're at and see how far they can go. What sort of tools do you give them? Do you take them to the grocery store? Do you show, ask them to watch certain videos on food prepping? Or how do you guide them towards that? So I have generated you know, countless PowerPoint presentations. And when I want them to learn about a certain aspect of their diet, I will show them a PowerPoint on that uh, particular subject. Wonderful. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about um, their short-term goals and their long-term goals, and then how this new piece of information fits in with those short and long-term goals. And then what do they want to, you know, what types of changes do they want to make based on that? Mm -hmm. I, I much prefer the, for the client to come up with the goals in terms of short-term changes or long-term changes, um, rather than me telling them, "Well, do this or do that," you know? that's wonderful. That gives them a sense of control and power. Like they, they're the ones making a decision for themselves. That's right. That's right. That's great. And have you seen um, say a significant improvement in a client or a story that you'd like to share? Oh sure. Oh gosh. Most of my clients come back saying, "I feel so much better." <laughs> and, you know, and they share their, their bathroom stories with me, which, you know, I'm the dietitian, so that's what we get to talk about sometimes. But, um, yeah, you know, professionals come to me and say, I'm so much more uh, adept at ordering a good meal for myself at a lunch, even at a restaurant, and then I feel so much better that afternoon. Um, I no longer feel sluggish or gassy or bloated, which is so important to me as I go out into the work world. Um, I remember I had a fourth grade teacher who was so gassy and so bloated all the time. She said, I just blame it on the kids. You know? oh, <laughs> so, that's terrible. So, yeah, and she, you know, she uh, had terrible uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and we put her on a low FODMAP diet, and, um, and she uh, is doing much better. So, yes, I've, I've had great success with people who come to me ready to make changes. Mm -hmm. You know, and the people who make the, the the good changes and, and the, the lifestyle changes and stick with them permanently um, are the ones who come back and say, you know, I, I feel fantastic. Um, you know, certainly my clients will come back and say, you know, you had me off dairy for all these months and I, and I was out and it was a party and I ate some and boy, oh boy, let me tell you, I could totally tell what it did to my body and I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. And so, you know, they have these life experiences, which are important. Well, I sort of have an idea of what you enjoy eating, which are mainly raw foods, but do you have a particular dish or salad that you'd like to tell us about? Well, I mean, so what are some of my favorite foods? I love eating kale and arugula almost daily. I love a big salad. I mean, I make my salad in the mixing bowl, mm -hmm. you know, or in the bowl that you would serve like to the whole family. Yeah. <laughs> and I sit down with it and I don't let anybody have it. <laughs> you know, this is mine. I love that. <laughs> so, um, you know, and then I, uh, the other day I made a, a, a butternut squash and zucchini type of uh, coleslaw and I used um, balsamic vinegar and some sesame seeds in it and it was just delicious. Um, so I, I make all kinds of salads like that with um, uh, uh, cilantro and parsley and, and then I add nuts and seeds and tomatoes and avocado. Um, 
you know, and in turn, and then of course berries. I eat berries every day. Um, I eat my oats, my oats uncooked. Um, I just soak them overnight, or I just soak them for 15 minutes in the morning, and I eat them uncooked. Um, and of course, I love quinoa and I love hummus. I right. love hummus. Yes. Um, and then I love tofu and tempeh. You know, and when I'm in restaurants, the, you know, I definitely order tofu with my dinner. How do you do it when you're in and out or vacationing somewhere? So I love to travel. And I've done a lot of traveling um, and since I've been plant-based. I've actually gone on week-long hiking trips in seven different countries wow. since I've been plant-based. So, um, and you know, one of my favorite things to do is to find good whole food plant-based meals wherever I am. And this last summer I was in England and every pub had a vegan rice and beans dish that was amazing. They wow. all did it a little differently, it was amazing. But that having been said, I definitely travel with, I have an oat kind of a breakfast oats mixture that I do, and I travel with a bag of that. Mm -hmm. um, I also travel with plenty of raw nuts and dried fruits. Um, and on, on the airplanes, when I'm on these long flights, I bring with what I call a snack bowl. And in my snack bowl, I, you know, I just carry a covered dish, and I would have um, raw uh, cut up vegetables from peppers, zucchinis, carrots, bok choy, um, and then I have a variety of nuts, and then I have a variety of uh, berries and cut up fruit. And you know, I might eat half of it for the dinner and half of it for the breakfast, um, and and it, and it works really well. That's it. Sounds like you got it all down. Do you find yourself that like you have to make a list just so, as a reminder when you're traveling, or you just already have it all memorized? Like you you know exactly what you need to to have when you're traveling. Right. So I'll tell you what. I, the last trip I went on was just a long weekend in New York, and I was working so much up to that point that that morning came and I realized I don't have everything I need. And I traveled without my oats, and I traveled, you know, with only a few, a little bit of nuts that I had in the refrigerator. And I mean, I made it work. I went to the grocery store when I got there, and I certainly made it work. I just ate some things that I don't usually eat, but that were fine. So yes, I prefer to be prepared. Um, but when I'm not, of course, you know, yeah. it's not the end of the world. <laughs> That's true. That's great. And what about your husband? Is he plant-based? So my husband tells his friends and our family that he is vegan every night at dinner. <laughs> yeah, if he wants to eat, he's gonna eat what I made, right? Um, outside of the home, he's a grown man and he chooses uh, what he sees fit for himself. Um, he definitely eats a lot less meat these days than he, than he used to. Okay, and so he doesn't have a problem if you're making a nice little salad for him or a sweet potato or anything like that. He'll eat it. He'll eat it, Because your food is tasty anyway, right? Right, right. <laughs> and you know, the kids aren't in the house anymore, but certainly when the kids are, were in the house, and growing up, we wanted to, to present a united front, which is a good part of learning how to parent in terms of the feeding relationship with your child. And so, yes, he would always happily and gladly eat whatever I was preparing. Now that the kids aren't there, he might say, let's don't have salad again tonight. You know, oh, really? Okay, I'll put something else together. You know? <laughs> if you had to recommend one book or a movie for someone who's plant curious, who's sort of beginning, what would you recommend? So that's a tough one. I, can I do two of each? Sure. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so I think that somebody, if somebody is plant curious, um, the China study is a great place to start. Um, it can get a little technical sometimes, and I don't think you have to read it completely cover to cover, but I think it get, provides a good solid background, and that's T. Colin Campbell, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think if somebody is plant curious because they had been to the doctor and the doctor says, you know, you have a family history of this and you're heading that way, um, then How Not to Die by Michael Greger is going to be the book I would recommend. That's a great book. They yeah. both are. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, it was the um, China study that really convinced Dr. Riz ah, because of the science behind right. it, the extensive amount of work that they did to collect this data right. and to prove that people were being affected in different regions of China depending, um, you would see certain diseases in certain, certain areas and not in others, right? right Do right. you want to sort of touch on it or not? So in the rural areas where they were eating what their traditional diet was, which was heavily plant-based, um, you know, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, uh, uh, autoimmune diseases, different cancers were occurring at extremely low incidence, extremely low numbers. I mean, they just, they were unheard of in these rural areas. Um, but then in the cities as people were transitioning, um, from uh, their traditional diets to a more westernized diet as these the processed foods were being introduced and right. fast foods were being introduced, um, then of course their disease uh, incidence, their risk of disease increased. And, and it was very clear in the studies to see uh, the, you know, what the cause and effect was.
Yes. As they change their diets. And so. the How Not to Diet book is a great book. I mean, it, yeah. it's the first half of the book touches on the 15 leading causes of death. Right. And which are mainly lifestyle related. Correct. And then the second portion of the book um, touches on the daily dozen or the 12 things that Dr. Greger recommends in terms of food. Um, and also it, it includes exercise. Right. And right drinking water and yes. consume, you know, being a little bit more hydrated, but uh, that's an excellent book. I've gone through it at least three times and I always reference it still. Right. It's, it's one of those books that you want to have in your library. Absolutely. Um, and did we touch on movies? Uh, what oh, would you movies. recommend? So, yes, I mean, so an oldie bit of goodie, I think, is Forks Over Knives. Okay. Um, I remember watching that and just thinking this should be required for everybody on earth. You know, of course, we can't do that, but I, that's my dream. Right. Um, and then uh, a little bit newer is What the Health. I really like What the Health. It was um, wonderful, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very powerful. Give some good insight, and you know, especially the interviews with the American Heart Association um, and different associations where you know, it's like, well, you know, this is what's on your website and this is what you're promoting, but the studies show that these are not necessarily healthy meals. Why are you still promoting them? And, and they didn't have a good answer. And you know, these are big organizations, and it takes a long time for change. But the more that we use our voices to promote the science and the evidence that's out there for this type of style of eating, um, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful that change will occur over time. Right. right. What is like one thing that you could say a person can do just today to get started? So to get started today, I would um, allocate on your calendar some planning time and some shopping time oh. and treat it like an appointment any other appointment that you would have. So, uh, you know, you might spend some planning time listing out uh, the nights that you would be able to have time to cook and looking for some recipes and then making a grocery list. And then, of course, again, having on your calendar the day to shop um, and buying those ingredients so that when you get home from work or from wherever you are and you're hungry, you're not at that moment saying, oh gosh, what, are, what am I gonna make for dinner? What am I gonna bring for my lunch at work tomorrow? You'll have the food at home. You'll have the, 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 the foods for your recipe and you'll be able to prepare it quickly. Um, so that planning time, you know, it, did, it, it doesn't happen because you want it to happen, right? These changes, right. Um, we, we have to put some effort into it and then we reap the benefits of, of that effort. That is a wonderful tip. I really think that you're very valuable uh, to the community, which is why we like working with you. Um, how can others get in touch with you? Well, so I have a website and that is marlaablon.com. So it's M-A-R-L-A-A-B-L-O-N. Um, and please visit my website. I post uh, new recipes from time to time. I try to keep them simple. Um, and then I'm also on Instagram, and it's just at Marla Ablon. Okay. So, and you can reach out to me both ways. And uh, thanks, yeah. Maya. I always really yeah. like working with you and Dr. Riz. Thank you so much. And I wanted to add one more thing, be the game changers. Yes. So we're all going to the theater to North Park Mall. Uh, on September 16th at 7.30. So if you can catch us before the movie starts and say hello, Marla will be there. Can't Thank wait. Thank you <laughs> so much, Marla. And it's a pleasure to get to know you a little bit more like this. So Same here. Thanks. thanks for stopping by. You've been listening to Dr. Riz and Maya with Plant-Based DFW.